So let me just welcome everybody to start with. I'm super excited and there's so much going on in this session that we have today. We have two, spe two very special guests here. Um, Elise Gallagher and Claire Conway are two marketing specialists, marketing experts uh, that we have known for a long time. Uh, they are both uh, CUA grants, but that doesn't mean we're partial. We actually see their work and um, totally endorse it and, and are big fans. I'm big fans of both of theirs. Um, I've seen what they do. They have, a, they have an intrinsic sense of beauty. They do high quality work. They are very strategic about their marketing. And they're also reflective in that they don't only do it, but they can teach it as well, which is uh, something that, you know, doing and teaching are two different things. And here we have uh, two professionals who actually know how to get this across. And that's why I'm so excited to have you both here today. This is going to be great. And you're exactly the kind of people I want to feature in a Launch and Learn. So thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you so much for having us, Andreas. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Elise. So maybe you guys can tell a little bit about the company and then we jump in uh, to do some exercise or to do something practical for everybody that everybody gets to take home with afterwards. Absolutely. Today, we're just going to talk a little bit about maintaining innovative marketing strategy. So just to introduce you uh, and introduce ourselves and tell you who we are. So I am Elise, as Andreas mentioned. Um, I started Ringlet in 2016. I graduated from... CUA with a degree in philosophy. So if anyone, if I can come become an entrepreneur, anyone can. Um, and then I went on to get my master's in communications from Johns Hopkins and started working in the startup world in New York City. I worked for, for a um, PR firm called Appleseed Communications and just fell in love with the startup culture and working with women entrepreneurs. And then I got engaged and moved back to Washington, D.C and wanted to bring the same sort of expertise and focus on women entrepreneurs to this area. So I went around asking women entrepreneurs if I could do their social media, email marketing, and uh, finally I got a few clients. I brought on our first employees and the firm slowly grew from just being myself and a couple of interns to now we have eight amazing employees who are all working throughout the East Coast. We work remotely um, as of the beginning of this year. Um, and we provide full service marketing for small businesses. Um, so that means that we work on everything from strategy and ideation to a full suite of marketing management and design, which includes social media, email marketing, um, design, website design. We do it all. Um, and we work with um, women-led small businesses, uh, everyone from restaurants to e-commerce sites. Claire, do you have anything else you wanted to mention about the company? Yeah, so what's going on at Ringlet is a lot of different things, um, but for entrepreneurs who need their marketing handled by experts, we exist as a full service agency. For entrepreneurs looking to learn how to develop and execute successful marketing and business strategy themselves, we have Ringlet Resources, which offers personalized coaching, e-courses, workbooks, and a lot more for getting that knowledge up and making sure that your marketing is efficient. We're really positioning Ringlet to be a one-stop solution for entrepreneurs looking to scale their business through sales and marketing. And I told my story a little bit, but do you want to go ahead into how you found yourself? Yeah, absolutely. At, at Ringlet. Um, so I'm Claire. I am the COO and co-owner here at Ringlet. Um, I'm really driven by data. I who studied at the Bush School. I was part of the Sioka Center through their um, ACCC initiative. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys again today. Um, but through a lot of the work that I was doing through my work with small businesses, we learned that, that only 5% of women-owned small businesses are making over $100,000 annually in revenue. Only 2% are making over a million. So driven by that data and inspired by the ability, the impact that women have on their communities, I joined Ringlet in 2018 to improve those numbers, to help women scale their businesses and to help small businesses scale in general. I love to see what they can do for their communities. So um, I specialize in that scaling through marketing, through business strategy and through pricing models. So um, I'm very, very numbers driven. So you'll see my bio has like a lot of the numbers, but um, 
I live in Philadelphia where we've been growing our team um, here in DC with Elise today, but um, I am really focused on how we create a hospitable environment for small businesses and how we make it easy to market them. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Andres. Um, so the whole thing is, so when, when people talk about marketing and then you get involved, it's, it's sort of a scary topic because you feel like it's, there's a secret sauce somewhere and that you have to be tech savvy and all of that. Um, but what I like about what you guys are doing is that you're very pragmatic. And so maybe Claire, you can talk a bit about many of our friends here on, on the Launch and Learn are, are not marketeers, but they have to do marketing by, uh, by, by the virtue of, of running their company. And there's no so, not somebody separate who does it or, or not somebody on, um, you know, on their level of involvement. Can you just like just give us give us a start like like get somebody going on marketing? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about some getting started on some innovative marketing strategy. Really well done marketing that's authentic and feels innovative for your company. Whatever you offer can be developed relatively simply. So instead of copying competitors or trying to keep up with every other brand that looks like yours, new creative campaigns, what you need to look at is your frequently asked questions. So I feel really strongly that excellent marketing can be created by looking at your frequently asked questions. So good marketing should answer the questions your consumers are asking. Great marketing should propose further questions and provide the solutions. So to start, if you're like not sure where to go with your marketing or what to do or what a campaign looks like, Talk to your team, talk to your consumers. What questions are clients asking? What questions does your customer segment typically have? Um, what are your friends and family asking? And then like put things in your website, like wait, like little chat thing, little chat boxes, or your look at your social media DMs and see what questions people are asking. And those questions should be the basis of your marketing because you should solve the questions that are being asked. Um, and then if next, if you want to go to the next slide, I put a little step-by-step -step guide in here for you guys on that. We find, just to interject, we find a lot of times with entrepreneurs, they get super excited about their offering or their product, and then they come up with an awesome market, a, a marketing plan for it, but then they forget the very first basic step, which is asking your consumers what they want, right? And asking, figuring out what questions they're asking you. So yeah. we are really focused with making sure that you're putting your um, consumers, your audience first, and always serving them, um, having them kind of in the You know, profile. the reason why I love this, and the reason why I love that you that you're leading with this is, as you know, we start every student in our class starts a, a small, a little business and, and a little exercise like that. But but it is a little business, and the most the most difficult thing to teach is this other directedness. That it's not what I, you know, this is not about how I want and what I want to do. It's, this is about me looking through your eyes. And what you really hit on the nail here, Claire, with this is, is to bake that into the process. Okay. And, and I never thought of it to, to say, what are the FAQs? And even if you don't have the business yet, you can still go around and ask people what it is that they're asking. Yeah. And it will bake in that you take the other person's perception. Those initial gut questions people have for you are the gut questions any customer is going to have. Like They tend to be the same type of questions. It's like free marketing right there. Yeah. And business at its core, each business exists to solve a problem. So, but some people need help on covering that problem because maybe you as the business owner have really defined the problem, but the customers are still gonna ask a couple of questions to realize that that's the problem they have and this is the solution to it. So when you build marketing around questions, you're able to really create funnels that serve the consumer so well and also give you as the entrepreneur direction as to like, okay, well, people are always going to ask me about X, so I need to answer it. Or people in this, like people shopping in this industry or people who are looking for these types of things are always having this problem or this question. And it just takes the pressure off of like, oh, I need to have like new marketing. I need to do this. I need to do that. Instead, it's like, well, we know these questions work or we're seeing new questions. Let's bake them into our marketing strategy. So my recommendation is to highlight two to six questions that you know the answers clearly funnel to a sale. 
So you know that like, oh, every time I answer this question, somebody's like, oh, I need to buy it then, or oh, I need to sign up, or oh, I need to, I need to be a part of this. And then each question will create its own marketing strategy. So then one question at a time, develop a sales funnel for the marketing. So content that evokes the customer to ask the, to ask the question, content that explains the question and creates further introspection, and then content that answers the question by positioning your offering as the answer. And it just kind of simplifies the marketing strategy. If you're doing it yourself, this is the model I recommend using. If that's still not, if there's still a little bit of questions around it, I do have some examples I can go through. Yeah, that, that's, that's, it really, we're really only going to get it once you give us the examples. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so on the next slide, I put the example of Ringlet because that's one of the ones we know to our core. But a question we get all the time from entrepreneurs is what is my brand and how do I communicate it? So Ringlet's answer to that question is we offer marketing implementation to define and drive your brand. We'll help you create that management. We'll help you do all of those, whether it's design or messaging or whatever it may be, we have the answer to that question of what is your brand and how do I communicate it? Marketing campaign we launched for that is called, what is your brand? Um, and the goal of the campaign was to lead and support the potential client in auditing their brand image and messaging, positioning Ringlet as the solution if they're struggling to do it themselves. So we feel confident in putting content out that helps them to audit it and define it for themselves. And if that content is enough, it's enough. But the campaign successfully funneled people to find the conclusion that they needed a little support in their brand image and messaging. And that's where we came in. Another example is with Terra Beauty. So um, Terra Beauty is one of our clients. They create beautiful, clean uh, beauty products. A customer question within clean beauty industry is why is clean beauty so hard to navigate? If you're not familiar with clean beauty, it's got a lot of definite, like a lot of people create their own definitions to it. A lot of the products are very like, this does this exact singular thing, or this is from XRZ and some people are looking for vegan, some are looking for waterless. There are a lot of questions, but for their, their target market, the question was, why is it so hard to navigate? Our answer was that they have a product that's a multitasking oil that does multiple jobs in clean beauty instead of one targeted job. And so Ringlet's or Tara's multitasking oil was the answer to that question. It offers clean, eco-friendly multitasking to make utilizing clean beauty easy. The marketing campaign, we called it Earth Made Beautiful. And the goal was just to simplify clean beauty, bring it back to the earth and point to all of their multitasking products. And it was a successful campaign in that. So those are two examples. Yep. Very nice. Um, I, I want to see if 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 somebody has a question at this point about their own company, I want to just, while we're on the topic, give people a chance to chip in on this. Um, can we just, uh, Rebecca, can you just put us on the hole and just see if there's a quick question that somebody wants to talk? Can I go ahead and just talk? Go Ask ahead. A question. Paula. Sure. Hi. Hi, ladies. Great to meet you. Hi. Um, um, what about messaging in the transformation? I mean, very often I hear through, and at least I've seen it myself, it's um, the idea that we have a problem, you have the solution, but how much do you bake into it in terms of people? Because what you're essentially saying is put the spotlight on the customer, right? And when you do that, they have to see themselves in that future solved problem self. So how, can you expand on that? Yes. yes. Yeah. So that transformation story is key to marketing, right? Marketing is storytelling, right? And so we want to make sure that we are giving people that vision of, have their future self if they utilize your product or work with you in some way. Um, what I like to, the kind of the formula that I like to give is, um, I'll have to, I'll have to put, write it down um, and bring it, maybe I'll um, put it on our, I'll edit our slides and put it in. Um, but it's something like um, your company provides your direct, your ideal customer with the ability to move from point A to point B. And that should be your messaging. That transformation should be baked into your mission statement. So it would be, for example, for Paola, um, Paola is, in, um, is creating homeschool uh, programs and curricula and things like that. 
So, Paolo, what would you say is your is your value proposition? Your company solves what problem for what for whom? So, I essentially uh, help the homeschool parents. Mostly, it's women. Okay, the biggest problem for them is you know, and again, I did heartily what you do, which is I frequently survey. You know, like if you had to sit down with me. For, you know, a cup of coffee, I'm a veteran homeschooler. What are the two most critical questions you'd ask me? Well, psh, hundreds of answers, but they fold into, they fell into six distinct buckets. Mm -hmm. So one of the big buckets is, you know, how do I choose curriculum or how do I manage multiple ages? So my products and what I do is I'm funneling them into a membership program to take them on that journey so that they can see themselves confidently managing mul multiple uh, ages and confidently knowing that their children are learning they're enough to go around. Right. Yeah. So you're giving them confidence and peace of mind. Right? Correct. A successful marketing strategy, like if you're, if we're looking just to use it as an example of the curriculum, like how do I design my curriculum um, or what do I put in my curriculum? I would start a marketing campaign with have you designed your curriculum as like for maybe in July, I'd launch the campaign. Have you designed your curriculum for the new for the new school year? And then I would probably spend the next couple of months over marketing each day, just giving little tips about like, make sure that you work on your X subject marketing today, their courses today. We are doing, we're here at our company, we're doing X, Y, or Z schedule to book a call if you have any questions like I would start with have you booked and then as they're reading the or have you scheduled your curriculum as they're reading your content they're going to be like how do I do this and then the marketing would say like here's what we're doing and then I would say if you're struggling here's how we can help or if you're succeeding share your wins in building the curriculum for the new year and it would just slowly get them to ask that question because maybe they feel really confident in that like Maybe they haven't realized that they need to ask the question of like, how do I do this? Maybe they just jumped in and now are starting to realize they need you, but they haven't fully formed the questions. Build it around getting them to ask the core questions because then that way you can create a really large campaign with a lot of content and that will prove more success because now they're coming to you asking the question that you've now through three months of marketing trained them to ask. And but Claire, um, would it be, does each company have one such question or would Paula like have several of them? Several, yeah, several. I just, I recommend doing it like campaign at a time or you can have multiple campaigns running, but I would focus each, each month like on two questions throughout marketing. Just try to see, like look at the seasonality of when some questions come in. If you have some constant questions, keep them rolling on like Instagram stories or email or always have those answers, but interchange them, just use them as like times when you like, maybe the holiday season is different or maybe the, um, maybe I know service companies were a lot slower in August. So in August we have to do more like pushing holiday sales because we need them to start asking questions about holidays in May realistically. But, um, there, it's it's more about like looking at the questions, seeing what you're asked a lot, and seeing where it fits in. But you do have to answer multiple throughout the marketing, pretty typically. Very cool. Does anybody else have a question on this as well before we move on? Okay, um, Claire and Elise, what? Um, talk a little bit more about the strategy then. In let's say. Going into next year or so, what what everybody here is doing? I always say everybody's in sales and marketing. Like it doesn't matter what your job is in any company, and we're in very strange times. Um, a lot of stuff is moving online, but um, but it's somewhat difficult to really pinpoint where things are going with marketing and what's going on. And uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about this. Uh, can you give us a heads up of what you see coming, what's what's going on, and what, what you think we should be aware of? Absolutely. So we came up with five marketing trends for 2022 to share with you all. Um, as you will see in each of these trends, consumer uh, putting the consumer first and putting your audience first is a theme throughout. So I'm glad we just went through that little practice so you guys are in that mindset. Um, the first trend I wanted to talk about was conversational marketing. So if you 
do not have social media or email marketing or some form of communication with your audience, it's not going to fly anymore. <laughs> we really want you to be in almost constant communication with your audience. The days of sending out one um, form of marketing per month, just when you need a sale is, is no longer. So um, within conversational marketing, consumers are highly aware of company values. So it's going to be very important for you to communicate not only your services and your offerings, um, but also to communicate your company values throughout your marketing campaigns next year. Your audiences want their marketing to be authentic and a two-way street, hence the conversation. So we want you to be asking them questions about how your product or your service can improve their lives. Um, your audience is focused on responsible consumerism and they want to make informed decisions. So the more transparency about your business, the better. That also brings in acknowledgement of employees. So consumers want to know who is behind their brand. They want to know the faces whom they're buying from. Um, so make sure to put your face out there. I know it's hard sometimes. We have to sometimes force our entrepreneurs to do that, <laughs> including ourselves. Um, but it is super important to consumers that they're seeing who they're buying from. Um, and um, LO, LOT devices and content marketing are allowing for hyper-local marketing. So people, even though we may all still be at home, working from home, or um, in-person events or some are, are still not up and running completely, they still, people want to feel like they're in community. Um, so make sure that your marketing is local. Our tip for implementing these, this trend um, is to really prioritize daily person-to-person -person interaction on social media and manage Instagram direct messages on an hourly basis um, in order to keep that conversation prioritized within your marketing. Does anyone have, I want to pause for a second, does anyone have questions about this trend? Yes, I actually have a question. Please, Hello. Go. I'm sorry, I have both of my um, screensavers. Hello, hello, everyone. So I have on my website, and on the website, I have three blogs. I'm, I'm a health and wellness and also self-development company. So during the pandemic, I um, did a lot of content on where I, I kind of pivoted to mental wellness and things like that. But now that that's kind of over, um, I have three blogs and one of them is Engage Your Mind um, and one is the Wellness Minute. So I was told by one of my mentors to stop doing writing and just video. So I began to do no less than two minutes videos and people love the wellness blog because I once I do it, I send it over to Facebook and I send it over to Twitter. They come and read the blog but they don't go on the website and say, okay, let me call her and take a class or something. So should I be putting like uh, classes that they can, that I've already like uh, recorded and they can take a class for $20 or um, sign up for a new class, things like that. I'm having a hard time getting them. They love the blog. I get like 167 views. They don't necessarily like it. And I don't like like buttons. I don't like that, but I'm gonna have to get used to that. I hate like buttons, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But um, so I took that off the blog, but I noticed from my analytics that I'm getting the looks at the blogs and engage your mind, but I'm not getting them to go on the website and say, okay, what does she really offer? And let me see. I can't just keep freely engaging you in blogs and you never buy, you know, call me for anything. No, how, what calls to action are you putting in each of those videos? What are you typically telling them to do at the end of the video or throughout the video to engage with you beyond watching what they're watching? None. That is probably it because it's not. It's on the website, but not on the blog. It's no call to action yeah. on the blogs. Within the videos, I would recommend spending the last 10 seconds pitching every video and talking about what you have going on that month or giving an update. I think it's going to be really important that you're doing your sales within there. Um, and also that within the, any text under the videos that you're, you're hyperlinking as many times as needed over to your services. So create, making sure that every piece of marketing or every piece of content you create has the call to action that points to you is going to be your best way to do that.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you also get, um, um, can you give me an example of a call to action just to, to give a couple of, so that we actually know what we're talking about? Elise, or, or, um, can you give me a, an idea of what a call to action would be? Sure. So on our social media, you can follow us at Ringlet Studio on Instagram. Um, we have a lot of calls to action on our post, um, also on stories, in our videos, and in within our Instagram feed. Um, so we will talk about, um, we've been talking a lot about holiday marketing, and we released a three-part holiday gift guide um, that went out to our email list. We advertised on social media and it highlighted a bunch of amazing women-owned businesses. Um, but when we were posting on social media about the gift guide, our call to action was to click the link in our profile and go ahead and download the, um, to go ahead and download the uh, gift guide. Um, we always want, we tell people that you need at least two to three calls to action on each page of your website and you need a call to action on each piece of your marketing. So unless you're telling people what to do with your content, or how to engage with it, it's not really providing them value. Um, you wanna make sure that you are not directing people where to go. Yeah, and also the calls to action can be like very clear, like click the link here, shop now, call us, book now, whatever it might be, but it could also be like, very simple. it could be very simple, but it also could be engaging like schedule a call with, like we did a, I did free consultation calls for a little while with a bunch of potential clients for our coaching. And it was like schedule a free consultation call to discuss, but that was like free sales calls for me. Like I got to pitch everything that we were doing to people and I got to help. I got to help um, them with the one problem that we called them. I think to like the call to action was something like um, audit your price. It could be something like audit your pricing model or like one simple solution to something. And then you have like an interaction with them. So it could also, it might not be a direct sale, but sometimes it can be a way to build a relationship um, or a way to help them engage. Great. Okay, we're ready for the next one. Okay, the second um, 2022 marketing trends that we wanted to share with you with marketing is continuing. Now we are probably aware of what influencers are. Is anyone, does anyone want to want me to explain, <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, but I think we all, all are aware. Um, but what's been interesting in the last six months, um, really year over the pandemic, is that influencer marketing used to be very focused um, for uh, product businesses. So a lot of beauty brands, but now even B2B companies are getting creative with how they engage influencers because they know that influencers can really be the connector between their audience and themselves. So um, influencer marketing is actually set to reach $13.8 billion in value in 20, by the end of this year in 2021. Um, it really helps you to build trust, as I mentioned, with your audience. And for um, really anyone, either business or, I'm sorry, either product or service businesses, social commerce uh, is an incredibly important space for you to be in. TikTok is changing the landscape of influencer marketing with creator marketplace, which I'm going to allow Claire to explain in a second because I like Instagram. Claire, I don't know TikTok. <laughs> I don't know TikTok. Um, and Instagram checkout has made it easier for brands to advertise and shorten the customer life cycle. So before where influ influencers used to um, have to click over, out, out of Instagram and go buy something, now Instagram has made it really, really easy for people to check out within the Instagram um, app itself. TikTok, so the TikTok creator marketplace is a, pl is a place where people can post their content and post their service, or really their products and items and services. Um, so it's really easy for people to, uh, anyone to advertise. You don't have to be a registered LLC or business. They're able to put up their uh, products um, and advertise uh, for free on a creator marketplace. Does anyone have questions about, oh, I'm sorry, to our tips. So what we recommend our um, 
our clients to do is to develop a comprehensive affiliate program using Affiliate or share a sale. They're both um, platforms that allow you to kind of organize your affiliate program um, and they are a relatively low cost um, investment. But can you be a little bit more specific? So um, I, I, m from my perspective, this is a very important tip because uh, internet privacy is getting turned up and up and up. And so it's, it's, it's less and less, less available to do targeted advertising on social media and, and buying data on, on, uh, on the internet about users because they're starting to close that down, uh, maybe rightfully so, that this information is just not, not out there anymore. And so by going after influencers, what you're doing is to go around and find, find out where your customers hang out and who they're looking up to in a sense. And then you have that person or those people speak about you, which is another way of, 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 of accomplishing the same thing. Of, uh, instead of you buying emails and then blasting them out to them or doing advertising pop-ups um, to a specific audience, you basically go to the influencer and then they incorporate something. But I, I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about, you know, we're not talking about, you know, the most famous person you're, you're thinking of. This is somebody who has a much, uh, who's just targeted to what you do. So how do you find a person like this and what is it actually that they can do for you? Yes. Yeah, so the most important thing in influencer marketing is before you ever engage with an influencer, you need to know who your brand is what your brand, like, what are the values that your brand holds? What are things that you know are like the immovable pieces of your brand and your business that are so important to its image? And once you have a clear definition of your brand, then you look for influencers that align with it. Because influencers, while they are an amazing way to make revenue, they're an amazing way to grow your brand awareness, they're also a risk for your business because it's somebody positioning them at, alongside your brand. So you can't just send your product to the top thousand influencers and ask them to share because what happens if you are a positive body image company and you do something surrounding like, I don't know, clean eating or, and good in the good food movement and you're really a, have a positive body image and you want to create like a health and wellness industry and you send it to an influencer and they post your post or TikTok or whatever it is. And then the next day they post like a diet tea or something that's very much against what your brand aligns with, you have to be clear on who you are. And then it makes it much easier to find people who are, um, who are aligned. So looking through, we use hashtags for a lot of the searching and we do a lot of like background research on our influencers when our team does it for our clients. Um, but at least you want to talk a little bit about the agreements and how to sure. find them. So I like to describe influencer marketing as just hijacking word of mouth marketing. It does not have to be complicated. It's simply finding someone who is excited about your brand, aligns with your ethos, as Claire mentioned, and they are willing to advocate for you and your brand. So this could be someone, uh, if you're not on social media, uh, which we would recommend you are, uh, but if you're not, this could be someone who is just willing to host a couple of people to pass out pamphlets about your business. That's what you can kind of picture when you're interacting and working with the influencer. You are equipping them with the ability to then go out and talk about your business and advocate for you and hopefully bring some business back to you. Um, but we, as Claire said, we do um, create agreements between influencers and our customers so that um, we, they are just very clear with the terms of the agreement. Um, we ask our influencers to post a certain amount of content um, and the, usually the business is sending them a certain amount of product in return for that. So at least does, so and then in, in your opinion uh, or in your knowledge, every industry has influencers, right? I mean, we have people here for, in the book business, in the education business, in the wellness business, in the product business, I mean, we have a, a, a broad swath of, of different industries here present. That does are you in, are you saying some don't, or is it everybody? Everyone does. I think if you're not, I, I think we should all frame influencer marketing as I said, is just equipping um, advocates to talk about your business. Yeah, 
and they have to, and, and in the fact that their influencers means that they are on social media or, or how do I even find them? Sure. So to find um, influencers on social media, we do a lot of scrolling. We do a lot of research. Um, so that's why our clients hire us um, is to help them find those influencers. But the way we do it is through um, a lot of research through hashtags and uh, because we want our influencers, some brands want their influencers to be hyper local, we're looking at where influencers are located as well um, to make sure that they yeah. um, brand ethos. And in some, within some industries, they might use the vocab word influencer or affiliate and ambassador interchangeably. Great. Uh, a quick question on that. So Claire and Elise, I can see where I get the value from that. What's it in it for them? And can you speak a little more clearly about it? Sure. So I mentioned that um, usually businesses provide product to the person that is influencing for them, advocating for them. Um, so really it's providing some form of value to the person who's willing to talk about your business, advocate for your business, whether that would be some form of like free coaching with you, Paula, um, or a free product or a discount or something. Um, you can get really creative with how you provide that value to the influencer. If you don't have the time capacity to do those types of things though, Affiliately and Share a Sale, which are the um, programs mentioned here, what we use with a lot of our clients, and they share the sale, just as the name says. So like they get 5%, 10%, 15% on people using the link, their, their, the influencer's unique link to sign up for your service offering or product. So um, you would get them onboarded through the program. It's a plugin for Shopify, Squarespace, WordPress. I think, I think that they're, all of those are from, I think almost every website platform. Um, I know that they work best with Shopify, at least in our opinion, they work best with Shopify, but um, you onboard them and then they, it creates either a promo code or a unique link. And that has, um, to answer the question about the security changing, which we're aware analytics have changed, privacy has changed, it has hurt small business analytics, but affiliately and share a sale, those links and promo codes do allow for some tracking, which is nice. Um, so there's a couple cookies within those links that you're able to know who it came from or if they went back to the link after 24 hours. But those programs track all of the sales the affiliates make themselves. They have their own platform to log in and see how they're doing on sales, see what their income is like, and request payouts. Just a quick follow-up. There's a question in chat. Do influencers get pay, ever get paid by the businesses? Yes. Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes with, through those um, platforms, they get a, if the person that they're speaking to goes through and actually buys from the business, the influencer usually gets a cut of that sale. Yeah. And also you can just pay flat out for posts as well. Um, they do, sometimes they can get kind of steep on the paying for posts. So you do want to be kind of clear on analytics from them or asking them for a report on their following, dem following demographic on whatever platform they're popular on, just so that you can do your due diligence and ensuring that it's a good, a wise investment. I know sometimes it'll be like, oh, it's $250 for a post, which is like an ads budget. That's a great, as it, well, that would be a great price, but sometimes they'll get up to like $5,000. And it, within those you wanna have, they're obvious, that influencer is obviously operating themselves as a business. So you need to treat it as a business deal and not an influencer exchange. You need to have contracts in place. You need to have all of your their data on their following to ensure that those are sound investments. Can, you, uh, can I, I have a, ask a follow-up question to this? Um, Dr. Sote here. Um, hi, guys, especially Claire. Nice to see you again. Um, how do you reconcile, though, the fact that influencers seem to be um, having motivation that's maybe not the one that uh, would be compatible with the principles that you uh, mentioned before. So if you know the influencer is getting paid to recommend something, why would you trust them? Um, is that also the way, um, the best way to establish your business as being, you know, my, my core values are such and such. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with that world. So I'm just uh, asking maybe a basic question, but uh, I'm wondering. Yeah. So this goes back to 
to our first trend, which was conversational marketing, right? And that people want transparency and to know a company's values. So you want to make sure your influencer reflects that values. There are thousands and thousands and millions of people on social media. There will be one person at least who aligns with your company values. And um, it really is important to monitor and be aware of how that influencer interacts with their audience, right? Um, and see how, uh, if that audience really trusts that influencer. Um, I think a lot of influencers now are taking the approach that they want to work with brands that they themselves would use, um, even if they weren't being paid for it. So in making sure that interaction and that there's trust between the audience and their influencer is important as well before you engage with them. And also just making sure that if it's a post, they're hashtagging, pay, they're hashtagging ad, that they're clear, that they're making it clear to their consumer that like, this is a business deal, but I do support this. A ton of influencers are really clear on social. Like I only take six brand deals a year on things I believe in. The other route that some of our clients have taken is looking at their Shopify and pulling customer sales reports and seeing those repeat customers and reaching out to see if they'd like to join the affiliate program because maybe they only have a thousand followers on Instagram, but if they made 20 purchases that year, you know that those people are referring you to their friends and inviting them to into the influencer program is going to make them feel really special. And it's also like, this is, you are our top customer this year. We'd love to give you a link so that anyone you refer here is receiving a percentage. Do of you, uh, Claire, do you consider the podcasters influencers? Yes. So then uh, like some, some of us who cater to the Catholic market could go on like the Catholic show and say, hey guys, you know, you're going to be a sponsor of that. And then and there's different levels probably of that. And, and then you have a very focused, uh, then you're really in the niche of the audience. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's a great idea. We love podcasts. Okay. We have a few more to go, but only about 20 minutes to go. So, so. So our third marketing trend we might be to is earned media. Word of mouth and curated brand experiences will help you stand out from the noise of paid advertising. So as we all know, um, pay per click is extremely competitive, especially within Google. Facebook is going to make that harder next year. Um, so what, how you can stand out is really making sure that your um, content is consistent and uh, provides value for your audience. So your consumer experience is incredibly important. So by consumer experience, I mean any touch point that a consumer is having with your brand, from your website to email marketing, social media, to any in-person events, to a podcast. You don't need to be on every single platform, but any platform you're on needs to be very branded. People need to understand that as soon as they see it, who it's for um, and whose brand it is. Um, so just paying close attention to every touch point that a consumer has with your brand is extremely important. Um, the tip we have is creating referral programs within your sales funnel to reward word of mouth marketing. Um, so we just went over a lot of <laughs> word of mouth, uh, some word of mouth marketing, um, influencer marketing, really, again, empowering your um, consumers to talk about you. Um, that means having a really strong email funnel that once someone buys from you, they know keep interacting with you moving forward. Any questions about trend number three? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. <laughs> so our fourth marketing trend is virtual and augmented experiences are the future. Um, so in light of the pandemic, more and more brands are looking to bring in-person experiences to people in their homes. Um, the metaverse will have a large play in this evolution um, and content needs to be more visual. So uh, we all know we're visual people, um, but we really need to be investing in great design now to prepare for the future of virtual experiences. I know that might seem really far off, um, but it's actually, it will be here sooner than we uh, can believe. I mean, sure, even Two years ago, we would not have thought that we would be on so many Zoom meetings <laughs> here, and here we are. Um, so our tip is to make sure your website design is agile, captivating, and easily adaptable to mobile usage. If you have not viewed your website recently on mobile, make sure you do uh, quite soon. If you don't know your own, um, if you don't own your social media pages on each platform, make sure you get them now. 
Do you have anything to add about? I was just at a conference with Cheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of Meta. Um, and this was the tip she gave us. So I can guarantee that they, we don't know a lot of what's going to be coming out with the augmented experiences. It's going to be over the, over the next year and then over the next five to 10 years, they'll have more and more coming. But the best thing you can do to prepare is make sure that you own everything with your business's name and that you're on every platform. Claire, how do you decide which, which uh, social media platform to be on? Ask your audience. Yeah. <laughs> Take a um, survey, um, ask friends, ask people who are interacting with your brand uh, if they look at more emails or look at more social media. Um, it depends on what you're selling as well. I think um, we always recommend to start with email because you are then, when you grow your email list, you, you when someone opts into your email list, you own those emails. So even if social media goes away tomorrow, you would still have those, those emails. So we always recommend starting there. Yeah, so always audit where your people are. You don't need to be on every platform. You need to be where your customer segment is. Uh, if your people are listening to podcasts, be on podcasts. If your people are, you get the idea. But still own the handles on every platform so that that way, should another one blow up, your name is not taken there. And then our last trend that we have for you is to focus on data and analytics. So if you go to the next slide, Rebecca. Um, obviously, so this has been a theme throughout our discussion today is putting the consumer first, but you don't know how to do that unless you're gathering data and analytics from them. So tracking ROI and audience behavior um, is crucial in order to determine your marketing campaigns. Because marketers are focused on customer needs instead of just pushing products or services, understanding how your audience is moving from each platform to platform is crucial. So is someone going from your email list or reading your email to your website or are they going then to your social media? Are they going from your social media to your website or are they going to your YouTube channel? Making sure that you're tracking that movement on a weekly basis is going to be really important next year. So we recommend having a strong CMS system that's going to help you track that uh, data. Is that a, a really big investment financially? No, um, there, are different, there are different levels of um, content management systems. Um, we've used almost every single one under the sun. So if anyone has um, and needs recommendations, we're happy to um, make them for you. But usually the lowest um, priced one starts around $50 a month. Anyone have questions about tracking data and analytics? Yep, I have a question. Sure, um, SEO, uh, how important? And do you have some recommendations on that as well? It's uh, what are the key things to look at and what are perhaps some strategies you'd like to share? Sure, so the first step would be to audit your website copy. So making sure that there are strong um, key phrases and keywords in your website that is going to help you rise to the top of the search engine. Um, that's really where I would start. And then you get into really paid advertising, um, which and pay per click, which um, we do help clients with, but can get expensive very quickly. <laughs> I actually did um, Google my uh, Google my business and pay for the ad service, but I was getting clicks from people from California for Botox or, I mean, it was everything but what I do. Yes. So I had to go back to, to Google and like, look, you're not really helping me. And, and I didn't know it was $58 per month like each month until they until they figure I reach $350. So I will be really careful if you do use the pay ads, like if you want to just do it yeah. once, make sure it's just once. I'm like now fighting with Google for a refund because you it was not my, and I've been, uh, had several websites over the 10 years. And this website I have 
has been in existence over five years. I'm just kind of in 2019 relaunching. So I just, I didn't want my address, my, I'm home based right now. So I didn't want my whole address on the website. So I decided not to use ads. Wow. And they went and did a payment form from some other format um, of Google and used that for that. So I would just, just as cautionary for anyone who's like still in development or whatever, just be careful who you get your ass through um, because I mean, even Google, it, it just is a mess. So, and I don't, I can't, I'm, I can't afford it. If I'm not making money, I can't afford to pay that. And I'm paying for my website. Another thing is the CMS, my website, they started off, you could build it yourself, which is Wix. And then they started to add on coding. And now it's hard to design your own website. And then it's hard to add things unless you hire someone. And that's, and so now they're offering, um, I just paid again to have this event I'm giving next month that they can come on the website and pay for it and go through PayPal. So everybody feels safe, um, you know, using payment um, things. And then they're offering, now they say, oh, we're for 50% off, take the CMS and and I'm like, okay, hold up. Isn't all this stuff? And, and you know, every month it's like something else they're adding on. Yeah. Um, and is it, I thought you could set up your own email because I don't have email marketing and they do incorporate that in the website, but I I did a test run. We usually, at, yes. Yeah, we usually work with Squarespace. Um, or WordPress is what we recommend to people. And um, what I also would recommend for SEO is making sure that all of your platforms are linking back to your website and that on your website, your other social media, um, podcasts, whatever platforms you're using for marketing is linked to on your website as well because the um, algorithm wants on, on um, Google wants to see that your website is active and that other platforms are linking back to it and that's linking to other platforms. Have you ever heard of backlinks? Because I uh, did so many webinars and stuff um, and I've heard of something called like backlinks and you, you, you ever heard of that as a way to drive traffic to your website? I haven't. I'll have to look into that. I'm sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole host of things now that I'd be very careful what I would trust. And and the what strikes me, I'm I'm not a super expert at it, but it what, what you said at least uh, uh, sounds very uh, relatable to me. Doing the proper research and and the time spent on getting the right search terms and and words is very important when when you do the advertising because it's like what you're saying, um, uh, Alvin, that it's it's just it, that net needs to be very tight to get the right kind of fish. And if the, if um, if if this just catches everything, you're gonna get calls from people and contacted by people that plug up your system, uh, you know, from halfway around the world. There's nothing who yeah. aren't even looking for what you're what you're selling. You know, yes, that was a problem because I'm paying to be called you're paying, for my yeah, services. You're paying, not for other. Yes, you're paying for each click on things like this, yes. which is gonna get very quickly very expensive. Yes, I was very disunsatisfied. I was not satisfied with that. And I'm not paying for it. So, <laughs> it's um, tough. Yes, I've yeah. learned that in business now, I have to like guard it like I did everything else. Like you have to like vet everything. I didn't, I went into this not thinking that. Like you vet relationships and well, no, this isn't working. I, you also have to do that for your business. I learned that the hard way. So, yeah. yeah. Very true, very true. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thanks, everyone. Thank um, so I think that we covered uh, point five now, right, um, Elise? Yes. Um, just to answer real quick Andrew's question about Google Analytics, that is a whole nother presentation. <laughs> but um, if you don't if you don't mind emailing me, Andrew, I can um, chat with you about it. I, or my email's on the next slide. And, and I also want to say, I mean, we hold these meetings on the regular way. If I know what topics you're all looking for, then I, I will line those topics up. I felt that here, I, I, I think you two are really pros at what you're doing. And I wanted to give everybody sort of a high level overview of what of even how to go about marketing and thinking about it. 
Um, if people, and, and I'm happy to have you back if, if I hear that people have, have other questions, but if, so if our audience is interested in more, uh, more details or, or help or anything, but like, where should we leave this? How, how can people be, uh, be working or, or getting in touch with you? Sure. So as we said, we're a full service marketing agency. So um, if you really know what's working for you for your marketing and you just need someone to offload it to someone, we're happy to take that off your plate. Um, but if you're starting out and you feel like you don't even have your marketing strategy yet, we can help build that up for you and then hopefully um, take it off your plate. So um, feel free to email either Claire or I to um, ask any questions about um, our marketing services. And then Claire, do you want to talk about our coaching? Yeah, absolutely. So Elise and I do one-on-one -on -one personalized coaching with clients. We just ended our fall 2021 cohort and our spring 2022 opens January 4th. We work individually with entrepreneurs um, and we work through a workbook series. We work week to week over an eight to 10 week course where we help you to develop a growth plan and customize whatever you need for your marketing and business strategy. So that cohort sign up opens January 4th. It closes at the end of January and begins February and will end in April. So if you're interested in working one-on-one -on -one and hyper-focusing on that business and that, that business marketing and strategy, we have that coming out right after the holidays. Sounds wonderful. Thank you all for being here. It's amazing yeah. to see your faces. Um, I know it's a busy time of year, so thank you for taking the time of your hopeful lunch break. Hopefully you got a little bit of break mm -hmm. <laughs> to, uh, to join us today. If if somebody has another, uh, just a closing question or so, we could take a question um, quickly if somebody has something. Of course, I'm always full of questions. Yeah. Um, real quick, was in terms of trends, one of the things, again, I run virtual events and this model of um, sponsorships versus, you know, that, and it's really more the state idea that, you know, you plop your logo on there and you get people, are you finding any trends of people doing innovative things to change up that type of marketing? Um, I'm sorry, it was the... Um... It's like being a sponsor of an event is kind of a, you know, the old uh, model of advertising, especially, you know, in a digital world where you get paid money to be a sponsor, we'll put your logo on all our merchandise. Is there anything innovative that you see a trend now going towards changing that up, that model? So we've been a sponsor for several online businesses and uh, events, apologies, and then we have hosted our own online events where we've had sponsors. And what I have found to be the most valuable for sponsors is giving them access to the attendees. So that is whether that's like giving them a 15 minute Q&A with them or some sort of interaction. Have you done that before? Yep. Yeah. We've had like virtual booths and things like that. Absolutely. And also having them um, host uh, the keynotes so they get their brand awareness, their, what their model and, and it's a win-win value value. But I just was wondering if there was anything else that you saw out there in the horizon, you're there, you know, uh, that's been innovative in the digital world. Always looking to learn. Yeah, so within the digital world, also a couple of events, um, event things that I've seen sponsorships being successful is that the sponsors have given maybe promo codes for their websites if they're a bigger sponsor and just to drive sales, to drive the attendees to their website. So it was just at a Forbes concert uh, conference and one of the speakers was Sarah Blakely and she gave us a promo code for her company, yeah. Spank. Um, and then also what I, what we've what we're seeing in trends as far as events and strategy is that bringing, because all events are still pretty much virtual or digital, bringing some sort of experiential piece to each consumer. So there is a company I love because I think it's really fun and she's been doing a ton of work with this. She's based in DC, um, but she ships nationwide. Her company's name is LC designs. They do charcuterie board kits. So she gives you like a step-by-step -step guide and you you are mailed uh, in a refrigerated friendly box and package this way to make a beautiful charcuterie board. She's been partnering with big companies who have been sending this because they've been sponsoring on events or conferences because normally a conference has three meals. It normally has like a whole experience. LC Design sends these kits out, gets branded printing for them. 
plugs in all of the sponsors things and sends these beautiful charcuterie kits that like is just enough for a family or just enough for a small group of people or for one. Um, but we did it, we used her for one of our events and it's a shared experience that everybody who's done it is a part of it. It prompts you to put it on social media because you're not really inclined by looking at a computer screen to be like, oh, let me take a picture. But when you have like a beautiful charcuterie board next to it and the logos of the sponsor have been printed all over, that type of thing, I've seen cocktail kits, I've seen uh, different recipe things. A lot of those have been successful in bringing something actually tangible to every attendee. Yeah. Um, it is it's kind of a pricey service to add to some sponsors for them, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, and it depends on the audience. I know we did a swag box to get that, have something physical that people can actually uh, open up in the mail virtually, but we're gonna start to do watch parties so that we simultaneously can run some of the events. So again, people can feel like they're interacting. Yeah. But I love that idea with food. Who doesn't love the experience of food and trying so? That's great, great. Thank you, thank you so much, ladies. This would be a very good topic for another for another session as well. The um, that kind of engagement and swag and stuff like this. But alas, it is uh, one o'clock, and I want, don't want to keep you longer because I would like you to come back. I'd like to uh, these these lunch sessions are are an hour long. It's uh, it's quick. It's very interactive, and we're very open to have you tell us what you'd like to hear more of. Um, uh, Elise and Claire, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you. I hope you come back. And to everybody on the call, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a blessed new year. And I hope you will be a regular guest again on this channel next year. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Blessed Christmas. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone.